All right, hello everybody. Welcome back. This will be our final lecture of the semester. Um, I know it's kind of crazy, time flies, especially when you're having fun. Um, I know it's been a intense year. I wanna say thank you for sticking it out all the way. Um, it's really been a joy to have you guys and I know things haven't been exactly perfect and I thank you guys for your patience um, and I really just applaud you for working through it, um, despite all the obstacles. So I hope this class was informative to you and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, but, um, anyways, yeah, here we go. Let's go into our last lecture. So for our last lecture, I actually created a new, um, new set of slides. This is a lecture I've never had before. Um, but it's extremely important, obviously. So today we're going to talk about smoke taint in wine. Okay. Specifically, um, in California and how California is dealing with it and how it was um, impacted the industry this year, especially in 2020. So let's start off. What is smoke taint? So smoke taint um, occurs in vineyards or grapes that have been exposed to high concentrations of smoke for a long period of time, resulting in wines that smell and or taste like smoke. So that's just the very basic definition of it. So if someone says that a uh, wine is smoke tainted, then it smells as if um, it's been exposed to a lot of smoke and therefore those flavors are in the wine. So that's what that means. Where does smoke taint come from? Okay, so volatile phenols, which are um, or or phenols, um, are basically smelly compounds. So what you smell the smoke is um, actually coming from. Um, those are absorbed into the skins of the grapes. It's not absorbed into the pulp. Um, then what happens is, but there are actually sugars in the, in the skin of the grape. Not as much as the pulp and all the other parts of the grape, but there are sugars present in that skin. So what happens is those volatile phenols come in, and then there's an enzyme in the grape called glycosyl transferase, um, and that will just bind that smelly compound, that smoke, to a sugar in the skin and then it makes what's called a glycoside. So that's what that compound is. So sugar plus the smelly compound, the smoke binds together, makes it a glycoside. What happens is that becomes um, virtually odorless because that phenol is no longer volatile and it is in bound form. So unfortunately it isn't until fermentation when the yeast cleaves that sugar and consumes it that those volatile phenols come out again and that uh, smoky smell and taste is uh, perceived again. So um, the only way to determine whether these uh, compounds are present in wine is after doing a small scale fermentation and then seeing what's present at the end of that. So that's, that's kind of what we're dealing with. It's kind of the monster of smoke taint. So hopefully it can help you understand a little more about um, the problems we're gonna be talking about in the next couple of slides. So um, just a little bit more on what is a volatile phenol or phenol. Um, it's an aromatic substance from a source. So basically the smells and tastes coming from a source. So when we talk about that, this refers back to our, I don't know, second lecture, the activity of microorganisms. It can come from yeast. Um, it can come from the grape itself. And I kind of classified smoke taint as coming from the grape itself because the smoke is absorbed in the skins. So it's coming from the grape um, at that point. Aging, so oak influence can have a lot on the, um, the volatile aromas that come from, um, from oak. Processing decisions will also have an impact on whether or not these uh, precursors that create these volatile funnels are going to be present. So um, here I have in this picture, just uh, if you're a chemistry nerd, just the structure of some volatile uh, phenols. Then we have 4-vinyl guaiacol, 4-ethyl guaiacol, 4-vinyl phenyl, and 4-ethyl phenyl. So as you can see, the structure of these guys is very much the same. We have um, you know, two hydroxy groups on these first two with a conjugated ring. And then we have, um, it's like a double bond, single bonds. Anyways, you can see overall that the structures are very much the same. So this is what makes them all phenols. This is the structure is what puts them into the group. The differences in how they smell is just uh, very slightly differed by what is bonded to them in their structure. So that is something for you. There's also a link to 
the Waterhouse Lab about what's in volatile fennels if you're interested in learning more about that. So I'll actually click on that really quick. So I want to prove to you guys that, <clears throat> you know, where all of these uh, things come from, it's, you know, just like I said, it's the activity of microorganisms, it's the grape itself, smoke, you know, aging and processing decisions. So um, here we go. Here's the page on volatile um, phenols. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong because it's been a long time and I know it from reading, not from talking to other people. Um, <clears throat> so the ones that are most often found in wine are the 4-ethyl guaiacol, 4-EG, and 4-ethyl phenol. 4-EP. So those uh, are microbials. So those come from the utilization of yeast, specifically for tannomyces. Okay, we're going to talk about that in the next slide. That's a typically a negative characteristic. 4-EP and 4-EG is like the, um, as you can see here, distinct aroma from sweaty saddle to cloves. Okay, so the thing about these... Um, these, these phenols or these smelly compounds is that in very uh, low thresholds, they can have a, a positive attribute. So like the clove would be a, like a positive attribute to the wine, but in very high thresholds, it can be very rancid smelling and um, very offensive. So at a, at a high threshold or high concentration for that compound, that's when you're going to get sweaty saddle, um, wet dog, wet band-aid and all of that stuff. So um, again, Brett is great in beer. It does not work out typically for wine um, in high concentration. So keep that in mind. So yeah, so when we talk about Brett and that yeast, that's the microbial that is referring back to the slides, activity of microorganisms, okay? I'm not just a crazy person. Uh, oak maturation, so the maturity in oak. Um, they talks a little bit about Brett in here. New oak barrels okay so this is so degradation of uh, lignin cellulose and hemicellulose during toasting so this is um, what the barrel offers as far as volatile phenols uh, do, 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 do. so the level of toasting or toasting as it said here the level of toasting determines what flavors are imparted by that barrel and also the length of time the wine is exposed to that barrel is going to be a big one you can see we have smoke taint in here. Um, so smokiness is also associated with the 4-EP and the 4-EG uh, volatile phenols, as you can see. So um, it also says here, <clears throat> it has been shown that the volatile phenols of smoke tainted grapes are located in the skin and do not penetrate the pulp. Therefore, the maceration program of grapes is a critical consideration uh, when working with smoke-exposed fruits. We're going to talk about that in the other slide. I don't think we need that last spot. Anyways, that was just to show you guys that, yes, these flavors and aromas come from all of these components here, like we talked about. Okay, here's another little table for you guys to help uh, also just reinforce that. So, um, for example... Uh, more common volatile phenols in wine. So four vinyl uh, guaiacols that can smell like carnations and clove, and that comes from yeast. Uh, the 4-EP and 4-EG again, that is Britannomyces yeast typically uh, associated with that. So um, guaiacol on its own without these other uh, constituents on it can smell like smoke and bacon, and that is from oak, wood aging, or literal smoke exposure. Okay, so that's uh, literal smoke. Vanillin is a compound that uh, smells and tastes like vanilla. So um, the descriptors for that are sweet and vanilla. And that is um, very, very typical for American oak. I always think, um, you know, I think of like vanilla Coca-Cola when I think of American oak. Um, so if, if that helps you, awesome. If not, don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, vanillin related to oak and wood aging. And again, there's that same link for you guys. Okay, so specific volatiles that are associated with smoke taint. So we have the guaiacol, like I was talking about. Um, for methyl guaiacol, syringol, O cresol, M cresol, etc. Anyways, um, so what would happen? So these are chemical structures of characteristics of smoky aroma volatiles that are found in smoke from wood fire, 
uh, and the naturally occurring grapevine metabolites, the transresveratrol. So, so this, these are the same. So this is like the stuff that's literally in the smoke as it's coming through the vineyard and it's being transferred into the grape, okay? And then it becomes bound with the sugar in the skin of the grape, but you can't tell it's there until fermentation. So once it starts to ferment and that sugar is cleaved off, then that smelly compound is released into the wine and then you know it's there. So these, these would be the compounds that they would be testing for once the wine has completed fermentation. So that's, that's partly what makes it so tricky. So um, for the vineyard, there's a specific time that the grapes are most susceptible to smoke taint. So um, if your grapes are still very hard and still green, um, you will have a very low to medium uptake potential. So those are very low in the early stages of development. So if it is before verasion, you know, your grapes haven't even started turning or softening, then don't worry about it. You're most likely going to be just fine. Um, after verasion, though, which is peak fire season, unfortunately, for California and also other states, um, that is when your grapes are most susceptible to absorbing all of that smoke and all of those flavors and aromas. So um, just to remind you, verasion is the stage where the berries start to soften and change colors and develop. So um, that's when they are most porous and most um, susceptible to absorbing those compounds, unfortunately. So um, just like we mentioned just very briefly in that UC Davis link, um, so how, how would you make wine with grapes that have been exposed to smoke? Um, since the smoke compounds are uh, mostly within the skins of the grape, there needs to be precautions about how much extraction from the skins you perform. Okay, so just like the page said, um, maceration protocol is going to have to be changed. So um, basically you want to minimize your contact with the skins and how much extraction you are pulling from them because the more you pull, the more smoke you're going to get in your wine as well. So this would include... Um, options that I've heard winemakers do this season is doing less frequent pump overs. So when you mix the tank, when it's a red wine and it's fermenting, you know, we mix the tank because it releases heat, it redistributes yeast. Um, it's really good to incorporate oxygen for your yeast to develop healthy cell walls, you know, all these wonderful things. Um, but it, instead of doing like three of those a day, you would just do one a day. So that would be a way to help kind of prevent that. Another way to do it would be a cooler fermentation. The cooler the fermentation for a red wine, the less extraction you're going to get. So that would be one way. Um, that kind of can be a hit or miss too because some people might say the cooler fermentation would take longer and therefore you might still be extracting from the skin. So I'm not quite sure. Either way, it's a very difficult uh, situation and you don't want to over macerate your fermentation. So you don't want to over extract. So those are some of the some of the issues we've been facing in the industry for the past handful of years. Okay, there's also a very interesting mention on fresh smoke versus old smoke on grapes. So even if your grapes have been exposed to smoke after verasion, right before harvest, um, if you, there is a fire right next to you, um, then the fresh smoke is much more destructive because those, um, those phenols, those nice smelly compounds are fresh. And if that, and particularly if the smoke sits in the vineyard, so if it sinks and kind of just kind of sits in your vineyard, it's not like blown out by a very uh, fast wind. That's your grapes will most definitely be harmed for that. If you if there is a fire in Australia and it blows across the seas into the U.S. and your grapes are being exposed to that, it's going to be much less harmful because it, supposedly the smoky compounds, those phenols, have a half life. So um, those aromas become um, less intense and less um, impact your grapes less over time. So if, if it's been 24 hours since the smoke has come from that fire, then um, it can be much less harmful to your grapes. So that is, that is some of the most recent studies on the effects of smoke with um, grapes. So it should be interesting. Okay, rejected fruit. Unfortunately... This, this year in particular has been extremely difficult because um, with all of the fires and all of the devastation that California has faced, a lot of grape buyers are 
um, straight up refusing to take grapes unless they've been tested for smoke taint first. So most everyone's been exposed to smoke taint this year in some shape or form. So imagine you're a grape grower and you have a legally binding contract with someone to purchase so many tons of grapes from your vineyard every year for until, you know, sometimes it can be until, you know, for five-year contract or 10-year contract, whatever. This person is legally obligated to purchase your grapes in this contract. It's all of a sudden demanding to see a smoke taint test before purchasing your grapes. And unfortunately, because of COVID-19 and because of the extreme demand of testing, um, the few laboratories that are involved in this process were completely overwhelmed, and it took up to 30 days, if not more, just to get results. So a lot of people had to send their samples all the way to Canada for testing, unfortunately, um, which 30 days for just a result can make or break the quality of the grapes when it's getting close to harvest. And also, as we talked about just, uh, just a second ago, to test for smoke taint, you actually have to put those grapes through fermentation, do a micro scale fermentation because the sugar, it'll be odorless when it's in those glycosides, when it's attached to sugar. You have to put through that fermentation and then test it afterwards. And that is a process all in itself. So definitely a very upsetting year that needs to be more um, peace and understanding between um, growers and buyers and hopefully... Um, some people were able to get through it this year. Um, so that that is definitely something that's really upsetting that happened this year. And hopefully with years to come, we can approach it better and work together. However, there are some, uh, there is some light in the situation. There's a lot of upcoming research and development on how to um, protect grapes from smoke. Because as we can see, California is just a really dry state. And uh, fire is most certain every year. Like, we're going to face fire and, and destruction at this point. So um, the extent of it is unknown, but fires will happen in our state every year. So in order to protect our crop, to protect our grapes, to protect our industry, and the livelihood of, of all these millions of people that are involved, we have all this lovely research, and hopefully we can, um, you know, every year we can grow personally to protect our crops. So one way to protect that's extremely interesting is um, by spraying this plant-derived product that's typically used for cherries. It has a waxy coating, um, and it, they would spray that onto the clusters to prevent gas exchange. So it, it basically kind of, it, it's, it's not just a one-time spray. You have to spray it four times to be most effective, but if you knew of a fire that was happening nearby and you knew your grapes were susceptible, you might be able to spray um, spray beforehand as a preventative measure. Um, again, that's one that you have the time. Apparently, this product is not extremely expensive compared to the hundreds of thousands of dollars of insurance it would cost to cover the losses of your crop. But um, I have a couple of links here if you're interested in that. It's very, it is very interesting. This spray, that this waxy coating spray is actually used very, very commonly already in um, cherry orchards and um, plums and other stone fruits because what happens is the uh, skin in a lot of varieties is very thin because we as consumers like really pulpy, uh, fresh just got juicy fruits we don't really like to eat through something that has a very thick skin so because of that well uh, during severe rain exposure or for some other reasons the fruit can crack like it'll actually continue to grow in the water conditions and it will burst i think osmosis is involved but um definitely look into that if you're interested so that's something that we already use that um, could be used for grapes as well Another way to prevent smoke taint in your grapes, which I actually thought was very interesting, is with ozone. So ozone, as we already know, is a way to sanitize, you know, equipment or even barrels in a winery. It's it's very effective. Uh, apparently, some people are using it to sanitize their grapes. And I read the article on this, but they didn't actually go into the science behind what the ozone actually does with the smoke compounds. 
Apparently, the results when they tasted side by side of a treated versus untreated wine uh, from smoke taint was very different, and the smoke levels were much lower. Um, there were some other positive things too, um, besides the smoke levels being lower and the wines that were treated with ozone. Um, but this is also something that winemakers are using as a substitute instead of uh, sulfur dioxide in their wines. So um, a lot of wineries that are claiming natural um, wines, or excuse me, organic wines, are using this as an option instead of sulfur dioxide. So what they would do is they put them in these what looks like shipping containers and they pump it full of ozone and they're not really sure at what concentration or for what length, but supposedly it helps. There was a cautionary um, little blurb in there though that if you're going to do this to your grapes, you have to inoculate right away because you have taken off um, all of the good and the bad yeast and bacteria from the grapes, leading making them even more exposed to um, spoilage. So I thought that was very interesting. So there's that. Another way to help aid in this um, unfortunate situation is some people are making grappa from smoke tainted grapes. So one example was Garden Creek Vineyards. Um, they take the ruined smoke tainted grapes and they actually get help from a local distillery, um, St. George Distillery in Alameda. And he decided to instead of trying to cover up the smoke and act like it never happened, um, he wanted to make a grappa that actually um, enhanced the smoke flavor and sell that instead. So some people who really like smoky whiskeys or smoky spirits would enjoy this um, as something to sip on potentially at night. But even with making that product and selling that, the winery estimated that they'd still lose around $800,000, which is a lot. Um, it brings up an interesting point of view, though, because some winemakers are about, you see different philosophies, is what I'm trying to say. Some winemakers are really about, you know, either A, it is my job to represent what happened that year, or, um, you know, was the climate hot, was it cold, did we have fires, did we not, did the power go out, so... For them, it is all about transparency, and this is what happened that year, and that is history, and that is why this wine is the way it is. For some others, they have a very um, consumer-focused approach, and um, I don't want to say manipulative, but they take the craft in shaping the wine, um, shaping the wine a lot. So for them, it's, my consumer isn't going to like this, I don't like this, and therefore I'm not going to even use it at all. So... It's an interesting um, interesting perspective, and with this grappa situation, it's kind of an ode to the tragedy of 2020 in a lot of ways. I mean, a lot of people suffered a lot of losses, a lot of land, a lot of fires. Um, it's extremely upsetting, but hopefully at some point down the road, someone will have this bottle of grappa and be like, hey, like, my grandparents went through this, and this is history, and we will enjoy this because it is sad, but it's also beautiful. So, very interesting. Um, unfortunately, that is all the slides I have for this presentation. Hopefully, you guys learned something new. Sorry for the short lecture, but um, hopefully it was an interesting topic um, for the classroom. I'm planning on doing some Zooming with you guys to help review for the final exam, and... Um, yeah, I think it's going to be good. It's going to be a good holiday season. 2020 is almost over, and we got nothing but good things coming our way. So it'll be good. All right, until next time, we'll see you guys.